But my name is Kirtana Tangavelu, and on behalf of the Department of Fine Arts, it's a great privilege for us to welcome to you all to this University Distinguished Lecture today by Professor Jyotinder Jain. The topic for Dr. Jain's lecture today is the modern and the contemporary in the vernacular arts of India. Professor Jain has spent several decades of his life working on the topic of contemporary folk and ritual traditions of India, and we could not have asked for a more distinguished specialist to speak on a subject of his expertise. I extend a very warm welcome to Professor Jain and sincerely thank him for his ready acceptance to deliver a lecture at our university today. I sincerely thank our Vice Chancellor, Professor Aparav Padile, for his ready support in facilitating today's event. He has expressed his apologies for his inability to be here today as he was called away unexpectedly from the university. I thank our Dean, Professor Tirumal, for his wholehearted encouragement and his staff for their able help in organizing the event. I now request Professor Tirumal um, to please uh, come to the dais and preside over the event. Uh, distinguished guests, Professor Jyotinder Jain, Professor Suresh, Professor Annapurna Garimala, senior colleagues, students and friends. <laughs> I extend a warm welcome on behalf of the University and Sarojini Naidu School of Arts and Communication to invite you to this distinguished lecture by Professor Jyotinder Jain. While a comprehensive intellectual biography of the speaker will be presented by Professor Annapurna Garimala. I'll provide a brief note about the scholastic disposition of the school and a short sketch of the speaker. Uh, I think in the last two years, we have had uh, two important scholars visiting us. One is Kiran Narayan and the other Vasudha Dalmya. And I see a connection between all these three speakers, including Jyotinder Jain. Uh, university of Hyderabad is essentially a science university, and that's why it required us to reorder this place. <laughs> we, I, I think we need a stronger presence of Sarojini Naidu School of Arts and Communication precisely for that reason. <coughs> Over the years, I would want to believe that the school has imbibed an expressive tradition vis-a-vis -vis the science schools, the humanities, and other schools, and experimented with both vernacular and cosmopolitan cultures. Though we had a special assistant program on visual culture, and we did conduct many conferences and academic events, at the end of the day, it's not clear to me whether a large part of India would have fallen prey to the Heideggerian formulation that the fundamental, what he called the fundamental event of the modern age was the conquest of the world, this picture. In a way, I want to believe the possible non-dominance of the world as picture in this part of the world uh, reflects the vitality of vernacular culture. The term Vernacular has been problematized by scholars like Homi Baba, Apaya, Sheldon Pollock, even Gil Gilroy, and others. And they made it an expansive and extremely productive category. I'm very keen to listen to the version of <coughs> Professor Jyotinder Jain. <laughs> Professor Jyotinder Jain is an art and cultural historian and also a museologist, someone who had spent a great deal of time in taking art to the public. He has held academic positions in the School of Arts and Aesthetics, JNU, uh, University of Heidelberg, and at Harvard. He has published many important works on Indian art and curated several critically acclaimed exhibitions like the Indian Popular Culture, The Conquest of the World, This Picture, 2003, Raja Deen Dayal, The Studio Archives, 2010. 
He has been decorated with several prestigious awards, including Prince Claus Award 1998, and more recently by the Cross of the Order of Merit by the Federal President of Germany 2018. We are deeply indebted to you, sir, for accepting our invitation and making yourself available for the lecture titled The Modern and the Contemporary in the Vernacular Arts of India. May I now call upon my colleague, Professor Annapurna Garimala, to provide the biography. Good afternoon. Um, I'll start with the students first because that's why the university exists, right? So let's thank the students for all coming, faculty members from other departments, um, colleagues, starting with Professor Tirumal at the SN School, my wonderful, wonderful colleagues at the SN School Department of Art, all the artists and the art historians and the wonderful year I've had so far. Thank you so much for also inviting me to engage with the larger community of the university by um, inviting uh, Dr. Jane. And uh, Professor Tirumal has done, and of course I also want to say thank you to the community of Hyderabad. I see many um, wonderful uh, colleagues, uh, people who've done seminal work, Suzy Taru, uh, uh, artists like Varunika Shroff, uh, museologists and historians of science like Sita Reddy. So many people are here and it makes me very, very happy that um, we're able to bring this conversation to several people. So let me just begin by um, sort of framing this, uh, this uh, lecture that Dr. Jane is going to give. He's going to speak for about an hour, and we'll then open the floor up for questions, open the conversation up for questions. But I think it's my responsibility to, um, he, uh, he's a very kind man, and he asked me to engage with him when he, uh, when he was developing the topic of this presentation. So I feel very comfortable sort of framing this lecture in a broader set of questions from my position, which may sometimes overlap with his, and uh, it, it's a very nascent kind of conversation that he's speaking to, because unbelievably, though this question of modernity and modern art and vernacular arts have been touching each other, a formal, thoughtful engagement with that question is just beginning in the last 10 to 15 to 20 years. And Dr. Jane is seminal to that conversation. But before I do that, let me just sort of um, see it from my perspective. I'm in my early 50s, so I'm of that generation who was not around for, let's say, uh, some big conversations that were happening in Baroda, for example. I was too young for that conversation uh, at the School of Fine, uh, the Department of Faculty of Fine Arts at Baroda, when it was really beginning to critique a certain kind of modernism and oriented itself to uh, a place for people. It was a very big exhibition uh, and felt that people had to come back into the modern. And if they came back into the modern or the modern art in a very particular way, which um, I'm still not, don't have a very settled or a completely worked out understanding of for myself. It's going to take a long time because, um, because of, I'll speak a bit in a second. The main question that uh, Dr. Jane is going to address today, which I think is a question that um, many, many people are beginning to touch upon, is what sort of relationship, whether it is a filial relationship, uh, a relationship that is framed uh, or uh, at the intersection of various forms of power, do vernacular art and modern vernacular arts and various form of modern art have? That's the central question. What kind of practitioners practice modern? Who gets to call themselves a modern artist? What, what, where are these artists and art forms positioned in formal institutions, such as the museum, the academy? And of course, what is that informal realm Everything in India has a formal and an informal, right? And often the informal is vast. 
And particularly when it comes to the vernacular and modern arts, the informal realm is quite huge. Why? Because first of all, the formal realm operates in, in an Anglophone world, right? It's all English. The informal world is streaked with, first of all, Malayalam, second of all, Bengali, third of all, many different languages from other places, but also the various structures of the institutions are really complex. So, for example, we have no formal art history program to actually think through the questions of the various histories, processes of making, archives, that something like the vernacular arts would stand in. On the other hand, the vernacular arts are a big market. They're huge, whether in the tourism uh, market, whether in making temples, whether in reproductions of courtly Rajput painting, whether in collaboration with people who call themselves contemporary artists, for example, in using, using, I use that a loaded word, the skills of vernacular artists, uh, borrowing the languages of vernacular art forms, under the mode of collaboration, under the, 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 form, the, the form of uh, collaboration or, the, or the, um, the rubric of collaboration. Uh, so there's a lot of informality. We, when I say form and formal and informal, things aren't really settled yet. So that which is sort of settled, let's say this goes in the National Crafts Museum, this goes in the National Gallery of Modern Art, and that goes into the Kiran Nadar Museum, this goes into Sotheby's, that gets taught, this doesn't count, all these things are sort of formal. What is sort of, what is informal is vast. Like, for example, is it black money or is it white money that funds the art world, right? Because black money is the informal sector, but it's also deeply a parallel formal sector in our country. So whether it comes in terms of the market, it's informal because if you don't speak English and if you don't make art that speaks in English, the position of that art form is really, really on the margins. And once it's on the margins, it's very hard to completely enter the formal, right? So all these questions operate um, in, a, in, a, in a very interesting way, and I'm really looking forward to Dr. Jane's talk today. Um, I want to introduce you to where his work is right now. So he's, you know, he has been so important, and Tirumal has already, Professor Tirumal has already said so many things about his um, career, but let's just remember, and I want, this is especially important for the students to know, because uh, it's important for us to understand how rich a scholarly life can be. Uh, and I just want to sort of make, I made some notes, not because um, his career, it's, it's sort of known to me, because maybe I use it sometimes to think about how I should shape myself, or how I might in in encourage younger people to shape themselves. Dr. Jane hails from Indore in Madhya Pradesh. And as we were just saying, he's fluent in Gujarati, Hindi, and Marathi, and German, and English, so, and Hindi, and Hindi. So he is a person who traverses this world very profoundly and engages with these languages in various ways, both professionally and personally. Um, he spent much of his early career in Bombay, and um, he was himself an artist, uh, studied art, and then went on to do a uh, master's in ancient history. And then because of uh, uh, getting a fellowship, he went on to University of Vienna and did his PhD there. And he had various fellowships, as um, uh, Professor Thirumal has already mentioned. Uh, but also, most importantly, and, and for me this is really, really important, that after he completed his PhD dissertation on groups of tribal communities that were living on the borders of Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, and Rajasthan, uh, very interesting work that's still very close to him. If you sit down and talk to Dr. Jain, and one of the great things about him, I can give you a, a small uh, anecdote. One day we were looking at lehengas in a museum and he told me a beautiful thing. He said that lehengas have kalis, these cut pieces which attach so that the flare of the lehengas like this, 
And I'm from a generation who didn't wear langas. We wore parkinis, right? Or langas, which are not made that way in South India. But in Northern India, they're made with these triangular pieces. So he told me, today they cut them from the tan, but earlier weavers wove each section together. Every kali was together. So this kind of information, it's, can, you can treat it as like, oh, a beautiful anecdote, but it then helps me, someone like me, really lead into a thing, a very deep process about how complex that kind of geometrical thinking, how to think about the body of the wearer, how long this thing has to last into the future, and what sort of lives might it have, right? So he, he's, he's been working with all this information, and over time, he's done things like set up the Shreyas Museum at Ahmedabad, which is uh, Lina Ben Sarabai's foundation. Um, he has set up, um, with uh, Pupul Jekar's support, um, and the, of course the government of India's National Museum for um, uh, Handicrafts uh, in Delhi. He has also, of course, moved into the academic world where his contribution is very profound by setting up the School of Arts and Aesthetics at JNU. And... Um, challenging the hegemony of a certain kind of art history, which is very linear, which has a canonical sense of what counts as art and what doesn't count as art. And when he had questions about the way the School of Arts and Aesthetics was privileging certain periods of work which had lots of English archives or lots of secondary material already published, he has been orienting everybody, go back to the vernacular languages, archives, art forms. So I have a lot of respect for Dr. Jane's continual quest to put these vernacular art forms at the center of intellectual work in the field of art history. That is not to say he has some ideological uh, problem with, say, beautiful Chandela sculpture or a lovely K.G. Subramaniam or a beautiful um, Akbar Padamsi. But he has a certain commitment and he's living by it. And I honor that and invite him to come and deliver the lecture today. Thank you so much. This is this wonderful new book of his. He won't show it because he's, he's modest. And, uh, but you must check, see this book. Hopefully he'll talk about the wonderful artist Jangar Singh Sham, the Pradhan Gond, Gond artist uh, who is no longer with us, but has left us an enormous legacy and set of propositions about what it means to be modern, contemporary, and vernacular at the same time. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope my voice is reaching out till the end over there. Uh, first of all, let me start by thanking the University of uh, Hyderabad to, uh, for doing this honor to me, to invite me to this university to give a distinguished lecture this afternoon uh, related to my area of work over the last 30, 35 years uh, that I have uh, done through my field work and things. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, uh, your wonderful introduction, uh, Professor Thirumal, and uh, I'm very delighted that the co colleagues from the uh, Department of Art History here, what do you call it, Art History or? Fine really? Art. Fine Art, yeah, Fine Art uh, here, and I'm delighted that uh, Annapurna is around, uh, Professor Thirumal has done a wonderful introduction, and uh, then also very nice to see Kirtana after a very long time, Varunika, and uh, also uh, Santosh, who had worked with me for some years and was such a pleasure to work with him. Uh, so it's very nice to be back to this uh, university. Some years ago, I was here for a conference that uh, uh, Shivji Panika had uh, organized, I believe, in this department. Now, uh, the topic, uh, as it is announced here, is the modern and the contemporary arts in the vernacular, uh, contemporary in the vernacular arts of India. Uh, before I begin to uh, directly approach the topic, I would like to mention that uh, the term vernacular uh, it has been under discussion. Uh, uh, Annapurna has introduced it in a big way uh, in a, a series of two exhibitions that she had done in Delhi. 
uh, we are always discussing whether there can be another term for that and just now uh, she introduced something called informal sector that becomes another term that we have to sort of uh, collate and talk about it. The problem with this is that uh, since these were some kind of, uh, with I think particularly during the colonial period when uh, arts were classified into fine art and decorative art and folk art and tribal art and things, in that I think uh, this kind of divisions happened which were kind of ad hoc and then when we became independent uh, almost hurriedly, in the first five-year plan, we established institutions like National Gallery of Modern Art, Crafts Museum, everything that was folk art or people's art, everything went into crafts. Uh, then there were a National Museum, which uh, sort of uh, swore by ancient Indian traditions of arts and crafts. So this was like, you know, s some kind of ad hoc uh, division of arts, which more or less taken from the contemporary colonial uh, predecessors and institutions were developed accordingly and then the entire art practice went in a way in that direction and that's how a certain sector uh, uh, or certain areas of art became like folk and tribal and meaning uh, clubbed with tradition. Now I understand that there, these artists come from tradition but the question is that uh, the these traditions are our traditions kind of static do they remain where they were we all even tribal communities and village communities they change in their every aspect of their life but we desire that their art must remain remain constant though others other things might change because authenticity must be uh, there sort of so they must not deviate from that so we may deviate in our dressing and everything but they must not deviate from their art because it is a kind of a search for uh, authenticity and earlier i think the art art historical and fine arts institutions did not much deal with folk and tribal arts so for them it was uh, uh, it was sort of uh, 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 there was a search because anthropologists were dealing with with those things and therefore any visual aspect of folk and tribal communities was related to folk and tribal religions and the anthropologists were dealing with it and they searching for authenticity they were looking for something that was static and was rooted in the past and tradition now my topic today is modern and contemporary the modern and contemporary in the vernacular arts of india uh, my my idea is that communities have not remained static and along with that changes have come and it change or ad uh, adapting and adopting the modern is not only common to modernist academic trained artists but also the, the, the tribal and village communities they have also been looking at the change that occurs around them and they've been coming in contact with. So I will be taking nine examples to show how uh, uh, artists from within those communities are responding to the, to the, uh, to the new. Now, uh, when, when something new enters uh, a tradition that is uh, practiced, visual tradition that is practiced for centuries, when something new comes, Old-fashioned anthropologists would say that is not authentic and therefore, you know, we can't deal with it. We have to search for authenticity. On the other side, at human level, the liver side artistic level, uh, how can it be that certain communities must remain for anthropologists' pleasure, uh, authentic uh, and uh, should pursue a culture that has been uh, practiced for, for a long time? So, how a a well-rooted culture encounters the new that comes into it, how does that uh, society or that those artists deal with that? That is mainly the essence of my talk uh, today. Now, uh, I'll just read a paragraph and then I will show you a few things and then continuously text and visual. This is how I uh, view my talk today. Uh, the, uh, my talk this evening, the modern and contemporary in the vernacular arts of India, will interrogate, uh, interrogate the nature and role of 
extra cultural transgressions extra cultural transgressions into well anchored vernacular cultures so uh, well anchored vernacular cultures meaning uh, those cultures with strong traditions still survive and when extra cultural transgressions come how they deal with those and that is where i think uh, both modernity and contemporaneity enter and how these two differ uh, will come to it uh, so uh, contrary to the orthodox anthropological position that these cultures are static and frozen in the past uh, uh, past uh, my talk will elucidate how the vernacular traditions imaginatively reinvent themselves so when they come into contact how they re and i'm mainly talking about uh, their artistic or visual tradition how they reinvent themselves as they respond to the new and the extra cultural uh, based on my 35 years of direct field work in the rural and tribal areas of india i shall trace how the traditional practices of ritual art forms traditional practices of ritual art forms underwent creative transformation with the introduction of paper so uh, you know when we became independent government of india uh, began to uh, devise uh, ways by which and this is a government intervention so government of india devised ways in which how they could help certain communities uh, to uh, to uh, to financially gain or to come up with their artistic uh, practices etc now this was very interesting that it is said that once there was a major drought in bihar and uh, indira gandhi who was very uh, who was among the prime ministers that we had uh, besides nehru i think indira gandhi was deeply interested in folk and tribal arts and textile traditions etc so uh, when there was a major drought in bihar uh and indira gandhi was familiar with the fact that bihar women of madhubani particularly but other parts of bihar they were uh very adept in doing certain kind of wall painting and then she thought that uh, so whenever drought occurred the government system was that when there was 40 45 degrees it was hot and there was no water and uh, uh, you know uh, the land was dried up that time in such heat the men and women had to break stone which was of no use it was just a kind of uh, non productive labor but but this was in order to give money to people they had to put in their books that they have done some they produce some labor so when mrs gandhi it is said that this uh, she said that i know that the women of bihar do very fantastic wall painting ritual wall painting and therefore she threw the machinery of all india handicraft board and handloom board and the ministry of textile she distrib- she got distributed sheets of paper uh, to to these women and many other part warli area for example in maharashtra the warli artists and they many other areas paper was distributed because paper wasn't available to village women so uh, so this is how uh, paper came and this was an extraneous <coughs> intervention into a culture so the women who were doing wall painting when they got paper their imagination began to function differently you know so they were doing only ritual wall painting so there were certain iconography these they were practicing but when paper came they realized that they need not confine to ritual iconography they need not confine to that scale they need not confine to that material they need not confine to the occasion for which the wall paintings were done and therefore their imagination began to go far wide uh, or wider than uh, than what they were doing so this kind of interventions when they came through government or whichever whatever but such interventions brought about explosion of imaginative uh, power of the communities and such things that came out of that of which i will show you examples so that was one uh, in, important intervention uh, another was um, encounter with formal art spaces the formal art spaces like museum uh, what did museum do to 
uh, to, to, to village artists. When they got occasion, they began to be shown in, in cities like Bombay or Delhi or elsewhere. And then suddenly their whole scale of doing work and their address changed. The, the original work that they were doing was addressed to their own community, etc. But now wider population, wider people began to come, urban audiences and others. So their, their entire address changed, you know. And what did that do? So certain artists, purely because of their exposure to museums, even like Jangar Singh Shah, they began to do different kind of works. It's another kind of intervention. And third, very important intervention is political, but not political in the sense of what I said in the Gandhi introduced paper, but uh, an intervention that comes from exploitative practices, etc. For example, uh, in Bastar and I think parts of Andhra and many where uh, uh, Naxal movements later on came up, but exploitation of farmers uh, by uh, uh, landlords and things and uh, money lenders and many things, how they reflect, how they begin police atrocities and things like that, how they reflect uh, to, uh, to those things, you know, like here you can see uh, uh, that policeman is demanding his weekly dues uh, from a uh, uh, shoe polish man in Calcutta. But I'm talking more about uh, other village communities where such, uh, so the people were not silent to these uh, atrocities or, or new administrative or uh, forms that came uh, to that people were responding in their art and therefore it is a contemporary their social and political predicament began to be reflected in their own art and that I thought was a, a major uh, major uh, move towards the contemporary you know, the, the individual expressions and things. So some of these issues will come up when I take uh, examples uh, uh, to, to show you. Uh, so the third one which I mentioned after paper and museum is in the art, the wake of new power relations resulting from new forms of governance. When they came, uh, certain things began to change. Uh, let me quickly read uh, a, uh, a few lines. Traditionally, uh, no, I'm going to show you a clip uh, and that is about, uh, you, you must have heard about Chow dance and uh, it exists in Bengal as well as in Orissa and now part of Orissa and Bihar have also gone into uh, in the constitution of other nearby states, Jharkhand. Traditionally, Saraikila Chow enacted a Hindu mythological place. You know, there were mask dancing, uh, some of you know. And uh, uh, so they were uh, doing mythological subjects from Ramayana and Mahabharata and Krishna and things like that. But lay of late, they have begun to stage contemporary social subjects in their repertoire. One such play was A Prisoner's Dream that I saw many years ago, Prisoner's Dream, which dealt with police violence committed on a, on a, on a voiceless uh, poor tribal man whose property was usurped by an influential money lender. On account of the issues of land rights, land grabbing by powerful exploiters and absentee landlordism, the peasants and tribals in many regions of India have suffered immense injustices. We know about it through the media and the thing, then the whole rise of nuptial movement. So, uh, have suffered immense injustice. The folk and tribal reflections of such insurrectionary encounters with, with modes of governance in their art once again remind us that these art forms are not merely magical or primitive, repetitive and frozen in the past, but are evolving and reflecting. So the, the main point that I'm making about this clip and later on is that these communities, we think that they are passive. When we go there, they talk to you, they you know, bow to you or whatever, and, you know, and they are very humble. So we think that they are passive receivers of what we go, what we, what we, what we do. But it, they are not passive receivers. If you look at some of the art forms that are coming up now in response to the kind of political thing which I mentioned to you. So I'll show you a small clip. Uh, as I said, chow dance, it's a mask dance. Uh, it, pertained originally to mythological subjects and all, but uh, in that festival, on the last day now, nowadays they do new subjects which relate to their life. I show you from a, uh, from a 
uh, half an hour film, I show you a three minute clip. <laughs> So the prisoner then gets a dream that he is freed and then he, is, uh, he becomes mad, you know, with the uh, with pleasure of being freed and then uh, he is killed finally. And before that, they, this is a half, a half an hour thing from which I have taken a clip. But from that, what I am trying to say is that never before Chaw festivals ever showed anything non-mythological. But look at the... The people who, and this Chow festival is not organized by an outside agency like Sangeet Natak Academy or something. It is the community's own festival and in which local writers and local people have begun to produce things like that. And that's what I'm trying to say that, that, uh, that my talk today is about such interventions that are automatically happening in those areas and what comes out of it and, and that how they are aware of the... Now, um, <clears throat> uh, I'll take up other such, such examples. Uh, this pertains to uh, the coming of cinema to Bengal. So, uh, <coughs> some of you might know by now that Bengal had a great tradition of scroll painting, which were narrative. So, even Santal tribals of Bengal also have Santal scrolls. And otherwise, uh, generally in Bengali 
the towns and villages uh, people were uh, they were patuas and the patuas were painters as well as performers of the scroll so uh, they were doing this long narrative scroll and which were like here you can see panel by panel that opened vertically uh, there was a uh, uh, as i said that how they reflect on the contemporary that's the subject so i saw this one scroll and uh, this one is about uh, it's a long scroll i'm showing only four five visuals uh, this scroll was about the arrival of cinema in bengal coming of cinema in bengal uh, uh, and uh, so here you can see that um, uh, <coughs> Oh, now you this uh, you see those circles over there. So those are the spools uh, according to because the Patwa didn't know how how it worked. So the film is sort of transporting from one spool to the other, and screening is happening here because the Patwa couldn't deal with the sidewise uh, uh, you know the audience. And the audience on this side. This is the screening. And actually, screening could have been here, but also old cinema houses in Bengal, and also that they have conceptualized it like that. So uh, that is the uh, first panel of that scroll, uh, amazing scroll pre painted in 1948-49 or, or something like that, because it was described by one Patua as af after independence. So maybe uh, uh, something uh, you know, because after independence also. What happened in the uh, in villages and all ethical values and things like that? These are also depicted. In the second panel, uh, the Patua, when he describes the part, he says that the elderly people, the diseased, all of them were rushing to see uh, uh, to see cinema. Then, uh, uh, when this was being sung by a Patua, he said to me that uh, the evil in influence of cinema was such that many people were rushing for divorce. So there is a, a magistrate seated there and because cinema encouraged divorce, so to say, that was the message. So, so people were come there, here the judge is arriving in a car with a lot of pollution and things. So all the small things were, then it goes on and on and uh, the, the scroll ends uh, with, uh, with this one, which is very important. Uh, 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 in terms of reflection of the uh, reflection onto the new uh, 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 by the patua. Now the lowest panel is uh, uh, is a comment. Uh, it's, an, uh, it's a kind of moral comment on the thing, and that how cinema sort of uh, broke up families, brought uh, uh, unpeacefulness, etc. So here the scene is that uh, that uh, young daughter-in-law. Uh, in the middle of the panel, lower panel, blue, uh, dressed in blue, she goes to see a film in the last show and always comes back late. So the father-in-law once told her that the mother-in-law is, uh, is always uh, working, you know, pounding rice and labor, the, uh, the domestic labor, and she goes and does not, no work, etc. So he just uh, sort of snubbed her. So the daughter-in-law got very wild and said, I'll leave the house. So again, breakup of joint family system, etc. Those things are involved. And then she, so, so the father-in-law then say, uh, he got worried. So he falls at her feet and says, you are Saksha, Chandika, Durga, you are this, you are everything, I'm sorry, etc. So, you know, this kind of uh, uh, social uh, change began to come, but that change began to be reflected in the art of Bengal. That is an extraordinary thing. The, uh, for example, some of you uh, might, and uh, those at least who are arts or might know about Kaligat painting. That was another genre of painting where a Bengal patuas were uh, uh, were uh, adapting uh, uh, certain elements of uh, stylistic as well as social elements in, in in their work. So in Bengal, there was a tremendous openness to the to the modern and the contemporary. So this kind of uh, thing. Uh, were happening. Then, uh, say Kaligat painting uh, in Bengal, when that came, also already in the treatment, for example, of uh, besides uh, uh, how they have con conceptualized, how they have conceptualized the deities, the treatment, for example, they must have seen Western prints, etc., painting uh, coming. 
and they realized that there was something like shading. But they didn't understand uh, uh, the, what it was. But they got interested in creating some kind of dimensionality which made the bodies more sensual, more real. And therefore, some kind of vestigious shading they began to bring in. And that is, again, it didn't happen in other art forms of India except in Kaligat painting. Besides uh, conceptualizing the deity, uh, kind of some kind of sense of humor. For example, in the left side uh, is the Shiva and Annapurna. So the, uh, uh, the goddess Annapurna, Shiva's consort, uh, she is giving him arms. But look at his eyes, because Shiva was a kind of uh, opium consuming, cannabis drinking, uh, <laughs> vagabond, he forgot, he had a wife somewhere. Uh, so, uh, so he just comes and begs. And as his, uh, in Kaligat painting, invariably, when his knee touches Annapurna's knee, his tiger skin loincloth falls off. Now, this is a standard motive in Bengali depiction of uh, Shiva coming to Annapurna. Uh, now, this uh, is a new, different kind of conceptualization of deities uh, that began. On the right side, uh, you see Shiva is uh, carrying the child uh, uh, in very uh, standard Indian way on, uh, at, the, uh, at the way, and then he is using Damru, which will sort of bring dissolution of the world very delicately as a child's rattle or thing. So this kind of new thing began to come. But the, uh, or I'm talking about openness of the Patuas to the new that was coming in, or they began to depict uh, the changing lifestyle of the uh, the um, uh, urban. Uh, uh, urban aristocracy and things that uh, he, they began to depict. So they, they were doing, well, there was this word Babu, meaning Babu was a person, they say uh, any person in front of whose name Mr. can be put is a Babu. So it can be a clerk, it can be a officer, it can be a judge, it can be. And therefore uh, there was a kind of Babu which was satirized in Bengali literature and painting quite a lot. So on the right side, for example, the Babu is seated on a chair and you do, you can't first of all sit on a chair and play a musical instrument somewhat like sitar but with those F holes which don't, which are only, uh, belong to violin, belong only to, to violin. Uh, but you know, this uh, kind of uh, new that was coming and was adopted and then uh, wearing buckled shoes and things like that or having uh, Prince Albert hairstyle uh, central party and thing. And then uh, here, uh, uh, left side, Babu is uh, sort of uh, uh, ridiculed by showing, uh, this refers to a Bengali proverb that uh, even when uh, at home there is nothing to eat and musk rats are having a party, Bengali Babu must go out with the pleats of his dhoti flaunting, uh, you know, uh, best possible or whatever. So this kind of thing began to enter uh, painting is not through the art school. It, it began to come through the observations of the so, so, so how they were dealing with, with the with the new. Uh, now I show you uh, three four things of uh, of an artist who is uh, now alive, maybe 41, 42 years old. He is called uh, Kalam Patua. Now Kalam Patua, uh, when I was in Crafts Museum, he used to come there and he showed me some of the. Uh, Kaligat style painting that he was making and he told me that uh, I know that my ancestors were doing uh, uh, reflections of contemporary life of their time like Babu I showed you. Uh, so he said I want to do a series of uh, painting based on today's Calcutta that is his generation and then uh, so he was going around in the back lanes of Calcutta and seeing say this is a thing from a tailor shop uh, where uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 not actually slummy, but chawl kind of ghettoized areas and small tailor shop and things like that. So uh, uh, he he saw a lot of these things, but that very interesting thing. For example, look at the ceiling fan, the way the clothes are hanging, uh, and using these graded tones of Kaligat painting, he has looked at uh, contemporary subjects. So. Uh, this uh, began to happen. He has done this painting based on previously a Kaligat painting where an enchantress is playing musical instrument. An original 19th century Kaligat painting, the enchantress would be 
uh, having uh, a kind of uh, m uh, uh, man tied to a leash and then the uh, the meaning attached to that was that the original Kalighat painting, the meaning attached to that was that uh, she was, uh, she possessed magical powers and that at night she would put a rose to, to the nose of the, uh, the sheep and the sheep would become man at night and then again in the morning she would put the rose to the nose of sheep, uh, 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 man they become sheep. So there is a, there are original paintings of that which W.G. Archer called Sheepish Man. So now using that from his tradition, he uh, has done this uh, today that uh, this uh, balding man wearing a mobile phone thing and how uh, is uh, uh, running after a, So, you know, he was looking at, at various things in the city of Calcutta and he did uh, uh, paintings of this kind. Then here you have uh, a, a, a very uh, sarcastic depiction of a, of a Brahmin who, uh, who goes to a barber shop and uh, his Vaishnav forehead mark is shown in the reflection in the mirror. He has a sacred thread and a, and a uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, not pony, but cutie, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so this Brahmin, and the barber is chinless here because in all Kalighat old painting, uh, uh, the barbers are always shown chinless, a lot of flesh here. So, uh, you know, so he uh, began to, he is a living artist, derives from his tradition the, the language of painting, what he reflects on his contemporary, uh, 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 like this is known as uh, honeymoon photo, or now one, one painting is uh, Kalampatua, uh, this is 9-11 uh, for breakfast, he did this painting in 2002. Now here, it's quite interesting that when, when the 9-11 happened, meaning when the Twin Tower in America uh, was bombarded, the images were all over on television, etc. And uh, so he has done this painting uh, that time. So uh, first of all, very wonderful depiction of a, a middle class home. Uh, the couple having breakfast, uh, news is on the television news being mainly male prerogative, so the man is looking at half-heartedly and the woman is not looking at the news that is being telecast. And then the way he's done the curtain, the fan, uh, the cupboard and things like that. And then uh, uh, he, uh, you know, this image that 9-11 that uh, took place that time is uh, imbibed into his work in a certain way that how it was and how it also tells us how images have their own life. So when there was a tragedy of 9-11, the tragedy was captured into an image and the image is detached from the tra tragedy because the image has its own circulation, its own power of circulation. So image circulates independently of tragedy. And let's not forget, all of us, that when we were seeing this on TV in those days, there was some sense of enchantment. You know, though we knew it's a tragedy, but we were enchanted to see, look how the airplane comes and things. So the image does more than, uh, more, you know, and it circulates very freely and it doesn't confine to one aspect. So this power of the image uh, that he also, Kalam uh, has uh, captured, and then uh, there is a, a, a scroll that I'm a detail of a scroll of tsunami that I'm showing here. When uh, when tsunami ha happened, Bengali patuas began to do. This is also a section of a very large uh, uh, large scroll. Now here people are dying in the uh, uh, water and floods and all that. And what what I really liked about this detail was that on both sides you can see uh, TV cameramen uh, who always come to these events and they are the telecasters of images. An image is something, as I said, moves independently of tragedy and we have no, no control on, on, on image. On this I would like to uh, uh, read a sentence to you and then we proceed with another.
so the the so uh, uh, in the, uh, yeah so the images circulate in the media independently and detach from the tragedy itself in fact the patua painter told me that his painting is based on the narrative of the events as he saw on the tv so you know how how images transform uh, they how they reach you and how they uh, so for that i think it's a wonderful example now is talking about these tragedies of tribals and santal and thing and how their contemporary social political personal predicament is depicted so there are three uh, different details from santal scrolls of creation so uh, the one on your left side bottom uh, a, a tribal is arrested uh, and uh, uh, his re- uh, his relatives are arguing with the policeman on the right side you will be amazed to see that today if you go to see santal painting and in that area even bengal painting the kind and kind of uh, i mean the the number of uh, illustrations of police atrocities that are shown and i think unless one has visited those areas and all uh, uh, you would realize that people live under fear policemen is like like yamraj for them you know and that begins to come into their painting so on top left also you can see somebody arrested in the police thing the right side is a very interesting uh, detail from a creation song uh, creation uh, uh, pay, uh, scroll uh, this detail shows that after in the uh, in the beginning the creation happened the first couple is created etc then mahadev was shiva visits the first couple so on top you see mahadev uh, with the last uh, uh, and he is accompanied by two uh, policemen who are wearing bullet belts now if a minister goes somewhere he is also accompanied or uh, by by security staff so if god himself is going he has to have something better than or as much as the minister would have but so in uh, in lower part again the gun uh, gun carrying a uh, policeman arrives at the house of which shiva at a house of the no these are the changing that are coming and these are like reflections that are coming from a uh, contemporary uh, <coughs> uh observations uh, around them and then here uh, you know in bengal scrolls and many other scrolls of india the last uh, panels are always showing punishments in hell and here both uh, that is repeat of this one but to just to show the hell below uh, that again either yamraj or his assistant chitragupta is uh, writing record of the people who have committed sins but again you can see that yamraj is shown as a as policeman over here so there are uh, these kind of reflection that happen now uh, i was talking about uh, uh, paper coming to warli tribe for example so warli is uh, jivya suma mashe uh, he died just in 2018 3 months ago and he is one of the most important artists of warli painting and uh, the warlis had a tradition of wall painting uh, and that painting confined to uh, the uh, wall painting confined to uh, the occasion of marriage like in madhubani also madhubani painting was primarily rooted uh, 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 in wall painting of bridal chamber so here also the painting that you see in the background uh, is the painting related to a goddess who, which presides over wedding of the warlis and then a wedding is taking place on the right side and uh, here uh, you see jivya the real famous master uh, painter is painting now what happened to that tradition what uh, jivya was when he was 3 years old he became orphan and uh, uh, you know the tradition of warlis is such that uh, yeah so uh, warli tradition is such that only women are allowed to do the wall painting because of ritual reasons etc and uh, so jivya who was uh, uh, who became orphan at the age of 3 
he used to hang around in the village and used to help women who were doing painting to hold a cup of pigment or something like that or the other. So he got exposed to uh, to the Varli uh, ritual painting tradition. And uh, eventually then uh, he also got from Gallery Camold in Bombay sheets of paper and they asked him uh, mid-career, they asked him that uh, we are giving you paper and w do whatever you like to do with it. And that time, Jivya did 25 fantastic paintings and it's interesting that he turned towards narrative. So, n uh, you see, ritual painting like that, they are not narrative painting, they are iconographic, they, they, they iconic, you know, there's an icon done in the middle and some really religious symbols, so it's symbolic painting. From that, uh, he, when he got a piece of paper, uh, got pieces of paper, he began to uh, do narrative painting. And uh, that again shows how certain innovations take place with such interventions that, uh, that uh, uh, happen. Now, for example, this is one of the 25 paintings that Jivya did, uh, 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 narrating stories. So he was told that, okay, if you have any stories, you do. So the story here, and most important thing is, you know, they were never doing narrative painting. So how narrative, how to deal with narrative? Now, what is the, uh, what is an important aspect of narrative is, how do you deal with time? You know, like, like if you are reading something. So you, as you turn pages, the time of, of that moment and the time of next moment, that is possible in a novel or in film or when you do an oral narrative, you tell a story. But how do you do, how do you deal with that time in painting? You know, but there are different times in painting. So you have to translate the narrative time into pictorial space. And this is how uh, Jivya, for example, dealt with the narrative time. The story here is that Mahadev, it's amazing that entire Central uh, Central Indian tribal belt from Gujarat to Bengal and uh, Orissa, Bihar, everywhere, Mahadev is the most important god. And uh, so Mahadev, uh, uh, there were smaller gods who were having their assembly over here and uh, they invited Mahadev to attend the assembly. When Mahadev uh, uh, came, he wanted to test the gods. How, uh, how kind they were to human beings. So he came in the form of an old man full of skin disease and a lot of flies around him and all. And he came to the assembly. So when he came there, so you, you see that... Uh, uh, so he came to the assembly like that. And the God said, go away. You know, Mahadev is expected. Please don't block the space. Just run. Go away. They pushed him out. So Mahadev went away. And then for 12 years, he caused a drought. And before that, he told Parvati that there will be a drought. So fill up some water, uh, save some water for yourself. So here, uh, uh, water is being saved. I'm talking about time, that how uh, he deals with in space. So, uh, uh, and then Mahadev didn't appear. After 12 years, uh, the gods became very emaciated and thing. And they came out to search for him. So they found him in a pond. Uh, over here, uh, you know, and all the gods came there. And then uh, Mahadev said, uh, drink this, uh, uh, drink the water if you want. When they looked into the water, they felt there were many worms. And uh, then, uh, but since Mahadev ordered, they, they drank the water even though they, and later on found out that they were not worms, but for 12 years their beards had grown so much that they were reflecting uh, in water. Now the story is okay, like there are many such stories. The thing is how uh, he has dealt with time, for example. So something happens over there. So space-wise, on top left corner, uh, one uh, uh, incident uh, takes place. Another incident that Parvati is filling up uh, water is over there. And 12 years later, when the gods come here, that he has sort of put uh, around here. And he has separated the time like this, he has given a niche to the uh, by trees, etc. That is a separate corner. I think. So, like that, the Varlis never had this tradition before. That they never knew how to deal with with narration 
in space space so they uh, invented narrative narrative devices uh, in their painting similarly jivya done another painting uh, here the the story was i think it very beautifully conceptualized the story the story was that there was a young man um, and uh, he fell in love with a girl in his village but the girl's father said that uh, i'll allow you to marry the girl only if you pick uh, fruits from a certain tree and uh, that should happen uh, only uh, day time but nobody should see you which was not possible so the boy was very frustrated and was sitting under a tree right side there uh, he saw a snake going uh, 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 up the tree and wanted to uh, uh, kill the little ones of bird over here and uh, uh, the snake was there so uh, he wanted to kill uh, uh, the so the boy killed the snake so on the right bottom corner you can see pieces of snake lying over there then uh, the bird came and uh, the boy told the story so and also he said that uh, i am very depressed because i can't marry the girl because day time how can i pick the uh, uh, fruits etc because so the bird said okay i'll help you you help me i'll help you and the bird said he took lot of sand uh, in his wings and then from the sky he dropped the sand and uh, therefore nobody could see when he could pick the fruit now story is immaterial but how wonderfully jivya has conceptualized the story pictorially and that i think the composition the whole uh, every dot of sand that is falling about uh, thing and dealing with the time the snake going up and the snake kill afterwards uh, uh, bird dropping sand over here and all all things you know so how these are exquisite paintings that 25 painting that jivya did is a tribal artist who was only rooted in ritual painting a triangular goddess and uh, that's all out of that is uh, uh, you know so i'm saying the new intervention how it can bring thing even furthermore once uh, jivya was uh, given a board 8 feet by 8 feet very large uh, and uh you are told do what you like you see what i'm talking about how space a uh, sort of pictorial space inspires you uh, you know so when this came uh jivya thought of doing two painting and he called said my life uh, you know so in that this is a extraordinary painting for my it's a detail of a large painting what he did was that you know he lived in north of bombay Uh, in a place called valsar but beyond valsar there are many uh, tribal uh, villages of uh, uh, varli uh, the whole village has a memory i, I don't know several maybe 5 7 10 generations memory when when railway train came to that area and that time there were all over these varli tribal villages there were farmers and thing when the railway train came it just ruthlessly cut the village straight because railway line cannot go meanderingly uh, save this house or that house and it just ruthlessly it goes so so he had that memory and he brought it back on the painting uh, entire village had that memory but jivya was an artist so the so he ex- described this painting that half of the river was on that side half of the river this side half of the field was that side half of the uh, homes on that side and this is how their village got uh, divided with the coming of uh, of uh, of railway so such things come up uh, uh, you know when when new possibilities uh, come this is the second painting that he did that is first time when he went to bombay he, did, he has painted uh, bombay central railway station from his memory then uh, i i would like to give example of a madhubani artist called ganga devi on whom i have also written a book uh, and uh, so madhubani also like varli they had a tradition of wall painting like, as you can see on top that this tradition confined to bridal chamber like in varli also so when a, uh, a girl's house when a wedding takes place uh, lots of wall paintings are done which have 
uh, uh, various uh, auspicious symbols, etc., painting, painted, but they are not narrative paintings as such. So Ganga Devi was one of the uh, uh, one of the Madhuvani artists, and she uh, 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 she used to paint. Uh, uh, her story is very very interesting. That uh, she got married to a to a man uh, who was very poor. They both were extremely poor, and then the man uh, uh, went and married a, a younger woman and threw out Ganga Devi. So he gave her some corner uh, in his land to build a small hut and she was living there. And uh, uh, one day uh, the, she said that one day the, her husband and his wife, new wife, came into her room and when she was uh, resting in the afternoon, so they came and said uh, uh, they wanted to open her uh, what they call baksa, meaning a tin trunk which every woman brings from her uh, uh, her father's place when she comes to the in-laws place and that is her uh, her personal belonging so the because the husband was very poor and the new wife so they told ganga devi to get up and said i will uh, we will take all what you have so they broke open her tin trunk which is never done usually and they took out everything so ganga devi talked to me on tape many years ago and then I wrote a book about her work and life. So then she said that when they broke my tin trunk, uh, she said that the first time I could not bear it. When he married or everything, I still could take it. Then she said that I, uh, my entire world was plundered. So what was the world? She said there were two saris, there were bangles, a soap, a cake of soap, uh, there were... Um, uh, uh, kumkum etc and uh, in a rag some rice was put and, and there was a silver coin so every morning she would make a heap of rice put the silver coin and do her morning uh, worship etc so when they took all this away she said I began to cry and uh, that's the first time she said I cried after the husband married I had no problem if she wanted to marry and then she said that when while crying I fell asleep and then she said when I woke up I realized that when I was 13 years old, I used to help my mother to do uh, paintings on village wall. Whenever there was a wedding, her mother was a good painter, so she said I used to accompany. So she said I would do painting, uh, 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 I would do some painting uh, and thing. That time paper was not available, but there was a Frenchman. Uh, he was uh, 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 he was called Yves Veco. He wrote the first ever book in 1960s, published by Thames and Hudson, and it was called uh, Women Artists of Mithila. And uh, that was the first book. So this Frenchman used to come uh, every year to buy paintings from women. So uh, in Bihar, uh, you know, they don't pronounce Veko, Veko they say Ba. So uh, he has become a legendary figure in Madhubani, and people say Beko Franci in the sense that this uh, Ace Veco became known as Biko Francis. Everyone knew that he comes to buy painting. But there was one woman artist who, whom he used to give small sheets of paper and uh, tell her that you get painting, uh, do painting. When I come next year, I'll buy from you. When Ganga Devi uh, suffered uh, uh, at the hand of her husband, uh, when she was crying and woke up, she went to this woman and said, I've heard that this Frenchman comes to you uh, every year and uh, buys painting. So why don't you give me some sheets of paper? I will also do some painting. And whenever he comes and buys uh, painting, you give me the money. Uh, so, so that's how Ganga Devi enters uh, painting on paper. She became world-renowned artist today. I think I was recently asked by somebody because I wrote a book that somebody wants to buy a painting of Ganga Devi of this size about for 50 lakhs of rupees. And that time, I think in her life, there was a, so she a market and thing. But she became very, very renowned. San Francisco Museum of Asian Art has something like five or seven large paintings of her. She didn't produce too much. but uh, So coming back to her story, uh, so she uh, began to uh, uh, do painting. But that woman said that, okay, I'll do it, but you don't write your name. Uh, 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 don't sign your painting. So she said, okay. And then one day, Ganga Devi didn't have uh, uh, soap to wash her clothes. So she went to this woman and said, can you lend me 50 paise, half a rupee, 
uh, for buying soap. So the woman went inside the house and after 20 minutes she came back and then she said, there is no balance in your account, meaning she didn't give her 50 paise for uh, buying soap. But uh, what happened was that uh, Ganga Devi gave a lot of painting, maybe seven, eight paintings to, to the woman. The Frenchman came and uh, he uh, 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 saw all the painting and he told that woman, but this is not your work. Uh, so she said, uh, well, uh, it is my work. He said, no. The Frenchman, he wrote a book, he had an eye for, you know, uh, whose style, whatever. So he said, it's not your work. She said, no, it's my work. He said, no, if you don't tell me, I'll not buy any work. She said, okay, I tell you, it's not, uh, it's not my work, but I won't tell you whose work it is. Still, that man bought. On one painting, at the back of the painting, Ganga Devi had signed her name, uh, but it was scratched out. So this Frenchman, he went uh, to uh, a government office there, handicraft center, and said, uh, who is this? So they said, oh, there's an unfortunate woman living in such and such village. So he said, I want to visit her. So uh, the, he hired a car and went to Ganga Devi's house. Ganga Devi write, I mean, talked to me on, on, on the thing, says that uh, a car came and stood in front of our house and that there's thatched walls. So she said, I just saw uh, 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 that there was a car. Then she said, Gadi mein se gora admi utra, meaning a white man came. And I remember Ramchandra Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi's grandson, when I told him this story, he said, Jyotindra, it had to be a gora admi. It has other significances, but anyway. So he came and then uh, he said, is there anybody called Ganga Devi here? So he, she said, she came out, she said, uh, uh, leaving all sense of, you know, women are not allowed to come out. So that all uh, sense of shame, I just came out and I said, hum hi Ganga Devi hai, she said. So this man gave her a paper, first time he gave her a paper which was two meters long and uh, one and a half meters broad. Ganga Devi had never seen a paper like that. She had not even seen small paper, A4 size. So he gave, and then he went on giving her paper and she went on, and the kind of painting that Ganga Devi created with that, this intervention is unbelievable a work that she produced. I'll show you some of that. Now this is the, a kind of land record register when Ganga Devi was hardly 13 years old. Uh, these are, you can see the British period, this is uh, uh, ruled uh, registers in which uh, land records were kept. So some such paper she got when she was 13 years old. She used to do exercises and things. But when the Frenchman gave her this last sheet of paper, she did two paintings of Ramayana and one a large painting of a Cycle of Life and then four painting later on after the Frenchman's uh, thing, uh, four painting uh, depicting her her experiences of cancer because she got cancer, she got, uh, contracted cancer and she did. Now here, uh, you know, again dealing with time, etc. that you can see on top, right corner and upper painting, uh, Ravan has come, but Ganga Devi has put that branch in between so it are, they are two different times and also uh, like in Sanskrit place that is not to be not to be seen sort of. So Apavaritama it is called in Sanskrit uh, So he Ravana has parked his chariot over there. He comes to Sita to, to beg uh, um, uh, as a kind of to kidnap her, uh, uh, elope with her and then Ram and Lakshman going uh, to after the deer this side. So this is one part, but she did entire Ramayana doing this kind of detailed uh, thing. And here, finally, when Ravan falls, when he's killed, uh, it's an amazing depiction that uh, that when Ravan falls, how he sort of he sees the world around him uh, swirling and swinging, and that's how uh, the figures are going uh, in that manner. So uh, she began to uh, do work. Uh, we, these are amazing paintings, I am only showing two details. Then she did a painting called Cycle of Life, that is um, Rites of Passage in Madhubani. And uh, it is a kind of large painting. Now, uh, how, her, how she works as an artist, nothing of this sort existed in their tradition except the Kober painting where symbolic wall paintings were done. Now, this uh, image, for example, is... Uh, 
an image where a, a young girl, because cycle of life meaning from birth to death and uh, again the cycle continues to birth, new birth. So entire, all pas rituals of passage of life were depicted by her at, at great length and in very fine miniature work. Now the girl here, this one, according to Ganga Devi, she was 13, 14 years old and attained puberty. When she had, you see the cultural detail because it's a rites of passage of Bihar, of Madhubani. So um, uh, she is being given bath by her elder sister. Then the younger one, a young girl standing in front of her holding a uh, fish knife which has jingle bells attached to it. And the girl in the ritual, the jingle bells are saying, may you get a male child. And then, uh, and the water that is being sprinkled. And when that happened, on the floor, fresh bamboo leaves are spread and uh, a, a floor painting is done which relates to puberty ritual. So, and then other small details, the bees, uh, bees on the branches and birds and things like that. Like that, she has done a four meter long painting. She worked on it for two or three years. But look what paper did. There was no tradition of doing this kind of uh, uh, cycle of life and details and things like that. And um, uh, second detail, even more interesting, that that woman who attained puberty, then she gets married and is pregnant. And then uh, Ganga Devi, you see, uh, uh, we, you, you know about goddess Ambika, for example, is related to children. In Hindu iconography also we see goddess Ambika holding a bunch of mangoes and ch children. So around childbirth, she is holding a bunch of mangoes, uh, you know, which is, a, which is not only a classical uh, sculptural tradition or iconography, it's also at various levels the belief. And then the child, Ganga Devi told me, inside the belly says, Oh God, liberate me from this hell. The child wants to be born. So, to say, so she described each painting, uh, 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 painting to me, um, uh, which I have uh, in my book. Uh, I have written detailed description. But like this, all the rituals that happen in Bihar till when a person grows up. Then the boy grows up and he takes uh, occupation. He is catching fish or people and the whole nature and surrounding around. But look at the cultural detail that she, the way she has dealt with. That for example, even things like that, that when there is an apparatus for drawing water, between the bamboos often snakes live. Then like that, every single cultural detail that uh, came to her uh, to mind and uh, uh, what she had seen uh, has been uh, uh, depicted here. Then she, <clears throat> 1985, there was festival of India in the United States. So Ganga Devi went to America and uh, 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 she came back. Many other, three, four other Madhubani women also went there and they all came laden with uh, radio and those days there's something called two in one. So everyone was carrying two in one. So Ganga Devi, also, Ganga Devi had no two in one, but everybody came. And uh, so she came without anything. When we went to receive her at the airport, I was at the Crafts Museum, we were responsible for sending these artists to, to America. So we went to receive. And then Ganga Devi didn't come with any such thing. But after three months or so, she came to me and she said that she had done two paintings of her memory of visit to America. And so again, you see how imbibing of the contemporary uh, and, and thing. So, um, this one uh, is a Washington Monument, uh, in, in the center there is Washington Monument and there is a lift in which Ganga Devi is going up the monument and there is upside down American flags all around and then uh, she, whatever she remembered, so for example uh, here she said that in, in America everyone is uh, 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 carrying a shopping bag, so that was uh, something that remained in the mind. And here she uh, said that when she went to buy ticket, wherever she said you go to buy ticket, you don't see human beings, only a hand comes out and uh, takes the money and a hand comes out and gives you the ticket. But you don't see, uh, uh, you don't see uh, uh, the person, this human touch is missing or something like that. 
so so these are kind of paintings that uh, she brought two painting and that one that last day all uh, uh, folk artists and craft people who went to america they were taken to disneyland and had a ride in a roller coaster so uh, uh, that is the the picture this is the only painting of ganga devi that i know where space is left which is not filled up otherwise all spaces in her traditional painting and later on that habit other paintings were also uh, 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 filled up with uh, with thing but there uh, uh, first time i saw that um, <laughs> that and then you see the train below before it starts the eyes are open but when when it goes steep uh, above then the eyes suddenly close so the, uh, that uh, she has uh, depicted and then when she contracted cancer uh she has uh, done this uh, uh, painting of 88 89 and that is the uh, first top left uh, side when she was making door uh, in the house uh, over there and that time she felt something uh, uneasy in her breast then she uh, village doctor some quack, uh, they just sort of uh, gave her some ointment and things and made money on her then she met a Uh, a properly qualified doctor and he told her that you are uh, you are having some very bad problem go go to delhi so uh, and the next painting uh, she wanted to go to delhi but she heard that her brother died uh, in nepal and came and so upper upper register of that painting the brother's dead body etc coming and people and then uh, you know scriptures are read out after death and all that happened then again ganga devi uh, finally started to leave for uh, for uh, no uh, here when this was happening the doctor happened to come to her village and said you are amazed that you are still alive because your cancer uh, you have a very he didn't use the word cancer but he said your uh, it is spreading you will die so then she took uh, she went to her uh, brother and uh, she had to cry and uh, you know farewell him and then there were uh, storms and rains and so on patna station the train remained for four four days and think and then they come to delhi and then she comes to craft museum and because that was the place where she had painted for four years the cycle of life and things like that so she came to us we brought her to all the institute of medical sciences they refused to take her uh, saying that there no bed available then somehow or the other we got her admitted then they said you don't have chemotherapy medicine and we got her medicines from abroad and she was finally cured uh, but these are uh, her so again you see the themes that she is dealing with is because of these interventions and things like that and uh, my my topic today is that how a new is dealt with by uh, uh, how do you deal with something that enters uh, in your then there is i was talking about museum that how museums have played a role uh, also as an intervention so this is a story of an artist called uh, sona bai rajwar and this is uh, she is from sarguja district in chatisgarh uh, uh, and uh, sona bai uh, was uh, she she had no child for many years and uh, her husband was uh, dealing with farms and selling and uh, land and thing in a small village so son sona bai was very bored uh, as, as she said once i wrote an essay on her and then uh, she began to work with clay uh, and she started to do amount i mean kind and kind, whole installations like if farm houses were very large almost like this every wall every place partitions clay uh, like this is a clay partition and then she started to do clay and we for clay figure like that so entire house became uh, uh, like a museum and it was very small place so no outsiders ever came but what happened was that when bharat bhavan in madhya pradesh was being set up that time teams of artists were sent out uh, teams of artists were sent out to uh, collect folk art or identify folk artists etc and that time uh, uh, somebody came to uh, sonabai's village and saw things like that and then uh, uh, so they uh, they saw things and they said uh, uh, we like your work very much 
and they were collecting for establishing Bharat Bhavan's uh, folk art wing. So um, they saw a screen like that and then uh, she and they appreciated very much so she was very pleased but then she said uh, the boy said uh, can we take one of the screens for our museum uh, you see how museum has uh, entered her life so can so she said uh, she sonabai said to me which i wrote my article she said that uh, uh, they were very nice to me and they appreciated my work and i was very pleased but when actually the screen was removed from the wall, I could not hold back my tears. So in the sense that her attachment to the work that she had done, but at the same time she was very pleased and think. But what happened was that after that, uh, the piece came to Bhopal and then the Manav Sangrahale, the Museum of Man in Bhopal, also became aware of her work. And then uh, she began to be getting so many commissions from museums and all and that provided her like paper provided some kind of uh, you know uh, base on which artists imagination could flare up. Now museums started to provide her large spaces and then that's how Ganga uh, Sonabai uh, began to so on your uh, sorry you see so these are works that are then done by Sonabai at Crafts Museum in Mano Sangrale in Bhopal and things like that. So uh, now you see the scale, uh, the scale began to change and accordingly the, her imagination began to be woven into the new work that she was doing. And lastly, uh, I'll show you a few examples of Jangar Singh Sham. Annapurna has shown you my new book that has come out. This is a different artist, a different circumstance in which he began to work uh, when we talk of extraneous intervention. The Jangar Singh Sham uh, was a uh, Pardhan uh, artist from uh, Patangar. Um, and uh, uh, again, this Bharat Bhavan team which went, they found a couple of drawings done by him. Jangar had uh, many gonds or uh, Jangar, uh, I mean Pardhan gonds or Pardhan did not have a tradition of painting at all. They had some geometric clay relief work. When Jangar came to Bharat Bhavan, it was a modernist art institution where again uh, he, uh, uh, he, he told uh, uh, Mark Tully, the BBC uh, journalist once that I am not gone to Bhopal to become an artist. I, we don't go to a city to become artists, we, to learn art, we go to a city to earn money. He was very straightforward. But when he came to Bhopal, he then again uh, was in the atmosphere of art as the art world, the market, the paper, the painting, and he was in printmaking department. And the kind of work that he began to do, so initially he did his gods. And once Mark Tully asked him, but how do you know your gods look like that? So he said, I used to see the shamans in our village and they used to get possessed by gods and from that I got the idea that how my gods would look like. So he created a whole range of iconographies of his uh, gods, etc. Uh, so that is his early work. Then uh, on the dome of Bharat Bhavan, a building that was built by Charles Korea, uh, he did a uh, painting. So this was very initial years of 1982. He came to Bhopal in 81, 82. So I like this photograph very much on the left side uh, bottom that, uh, uh, that this tribal artist comes to Bhopal. He does this magnificent work. People standing below, they all admire him. He, he just, he treats himself as a laborer. I mean, he just behaves and he was in the sense that, you know, and before he came to Bhopal, he told Mark Kelly in an interview, Mark asked him, uh, what, what, what were you doing before you came to Bhopal? He said, I, I, used to, uh, be wo I used to be working when I was uh, 14 years old uh, uh, as laborer in road construction. So he said, I used to carry mud on my uh, head and thing. And when the Bhopal people came, I was doing that and somebody said, we have seen your drawing. So he said, yeah, yeah I have done that drawing. Well, he just picked up charcoal from the roadside and just did some uh, drawing of Anuman on a village white wall of a temple. Uh, just uh, casual drawing. Then he came to Bhopal. So here is an artist who doesn't come from a tradition like Ganga Devi or, uh, you know, but in the atmosphere of, uh, of Bharat Bhavan where artists were working, but he knew one thing, that easiest thing would be 
to do abstraction, just throw color or whatever. He knew that this is not his thing. And then, besides physical things like paper and um, uh, material, uh, like once he said that when I first time applied with my brush uh, uh, poster color on paper, which he had never seen such bright color, he said, Tem uh, tremors went through my body. He said, to, to see the, the power of color, he said, my body was trembling, you know. So, so there was some kind of artist in him when he, uh, uh, you know, but this is a marvelous photograph where he has not, he hasn't got any of the airs of, you know, he just like, uh, you know, he created something like that which he never did in his village. And uh, things, and then the, that dome was done. Artist Swaminathan had also done one dome. All these don't exist. And then, Jangar, this this very marvelous painting that I told you that all tribal artists, all of them, all folk artists, whether it's Madhubani, whether it's Wali, when they get paper, they turn to narrative. They want to tell their stories, which isn't the case in the village. You know, they, they were just, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, they somehow turn, this is an amazing thing. Also, if you look at la Latin American countries and things, you'll find that when new materials come, they, they want to tell the story. So, uh, here there is an amazing painting that he did uh, because Pardhans are also, you see, a lot of tribal communities are influenced somewhat, influenced or not influenced, but come into contact with Hindu mythology also. So, the story of uh, 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 five Pandavas and Draupadi, it also exists in a different version in tribal area. But what he did, that story, how he told, and also the story of Shravana, who took his blind parents on pilgrimage, that story, most of you must be knowing. Now, those stories uh, came back to his mind, and he did the same thing. So, the background, the yellow, red, etc., looks like almost aerial view of the earth, fields and rivulets and things like that. And then he has uh, created some kind of uh, he has opened windows or kind of in insets uh, thing in which he has done fine drawing. And what the story here is partly uh, Hindu story, but pa uh, partly tribal uh, story. That uh, this is Sh uh, Mahadeva Shiva, this is Parvati. And uh, one day, then uh, Parvati said, I'm going for a walk, going for a stroll. So she went out. When she went out, she saw five cows. Uh, uh, there was, uh, I mean, a bull having intercourse with five cows. Then when she went ahead, she found several dogs having intercourse with a female uh, dog. Uh, and then she also, uh, so, so she saw this, and then she uh, laughed. Uh, the story was narrated to me by another uh, his community, Jangar. So Parvati, when she saw these five cows and a bull, she just laughed. So the cow said, that don't laugh at me. In next birth, you will be born as Draupadi and you will be married to five Pandavas. Now, this is not a Hindu version. This is a, a version that is prevalent in that community. So, he has brought those myths and things from his memory and many such paintings he has done. Of course, he has also this Shravana story that uh, Dasharath is shooting an arrow, Shravana's parents are here, Shravan goes to get water, arrow uh, hits him and things. And then he does this eye. And he says that this eye is from primordial times and has watched all Ramayana, Mahabharata, whatever happened, this eye is the witness to all the uh, all what happened. So he just put that eye which is roaming and looking across time. So look at the dealing with the time, primeval, primeval times, uh, uh, the story of Parvati, Shravan story, and the way he opens this window and thing. This is, I think, uh, amazing that has happened through interventions and things. And then I think last, uh, no, two more slides. Uh, he did uh, a Padhan myth of creation, where also, again, a creature like that appears and also like this. And this is slight variation of the uh, also Hindu myth that uh, when Shiva came and wanted to enter the house, and Ganesh, uh, uh, sorry, I mean a child, Ganesh, who didn't allow him to go. So, um, uh, Shiva chopped his hand and then Parvati said, what have you done? It's our, you know, and then he said, whichever creature you see first outside, you bring the head. So, she brought an uh, 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 elephant's head and, and Ganesh came. Here the story is that she saw first time uh, 
uh, when she went out, she saw a crab, and that crab. Uh, so they have this. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and he says that in in ancient times the crabs had some kind of snout, and therefore the crab. The head was chopped and put uh, on, on. So there is slight uh, variation. And then the god created a crow. And then there were there were floods and all that, and to get some earth to, cre uh, to create the earth and things like that. So these are uh, uh, he has taken these stories and put them on right side. The serpent Stacia, uh, which is holding the earth, but earth generally uh, depicted uh, after 17th century in the form of a globe. But uh, here. For them, the earth is the forest and the hills. So that is how he has depicted the uh, earth in the painting. And uh, uh, Jangar, when Charles Korea, the renowned architect, he built Vidhan Bhavan assembly building in Bhopal. Jangar was uh, appointed as uh, an artist to do uh, to do murals. So there are two uh, two. Section one mural was done by Gulam Mamashe, uh, a modern artist, and then Jangar. I suggested to Charles. I was the advisor, and I said, Madhya Pradesh has so many tribal communities, so why not we ask some? Because legislation will be done in the assembly building also for the tribal. So you know, we uh, uh, commissioned him to do these uh, murals over here, and how uh, he has sort of the the tiger on that side and the airplane here. They don't belong to actually his his way of dealing with images and things like that. And uh, <clears throat> but how these drawings were done by an art school trained artist, and you can see when and Gulam Sheikh once also wrote a little bit. He didn't know that it was done by an art school trained artist, but he also talked about their extraneousness that they don't belong to. So so Jangar's airplanes would have been like this. But this is some drawing that was done. But while researching, I found out who did the drawing, and I even have a photograph of a, an art school trained artist doing the drawing. And then Jangar has covered it with his own uh, signature style and thing. But still, he was open to influences that come from outside. And lastly, uh, <coughs> Jangar uh, Singh Sham on the left side. And uh, uh, it's an interesting comment. Once I asked Jangar that. Um, <coughs> What does your name mean, Jangar? <laughs> Look at the irony. He said that on the day when I was born, Census Authority of India, they came to my village, officers of the Census Authority came to my village. And in Hindi, uh, Census Authority is known as Janganana Adhikari, you know, Janganana Adhikari. So he said the Janganana Adhikari came to my village and they said, Oh, today we have come and a child is born, so the child should be called Jan Jangan. You know. But Jangan is a very Sanskritic formulation. So he said, But since my people in the village not being educated and Sanskritic, so they vernacularized it as Jangar because they couldn't pronounce. Now, the opening words of our national anthem. Jangana is the popular populous at large people of India, so to say. So from that he was vernacularized, and as I often a light in a light way and say, he remained a vernacular artist always. But on the right side, what happens is that how Jangar, um, you see, uh, Jangar died uh, uh, a very bad death. He, uh, he became very famous. He became so famous that. Uh, for example, in France or in Japan, his paintings are selling today at nothing, a largest painting would not be less than 50 lakhs or more. He is very big, but in lifetime also, he became very famous artist. So he was invited to Japan uh, to do some, uh, uh, to stay in a museum, do an artist residency. And there uh, he was asked, he was paid 12,000 rupees a month. And um, he, he went there, he didn't want to go. Before going, he phoned me. He said, I'm very unwilling to go, I'm not very happy to go there, but I can't say no, that's my temperament and things, so he went there. And there I think they gave him more and gave him more and more works and he was longing for his family. He wrote two letters which I published in the book that 
Annapurna showed you. And uh, there he says that how they extended his stay for three more months. He was uh, not happy to do that. He had many problems. He wanted to go back home. And finally, uh, he just committed suicide in his Japanese uh, horse house. So that story is, uh, it, 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 it has many dimensions. And that uh, photograph, uh, for the, to cut it short now, is that one day uh, I asked Jangar, I was doing an exhibition called Other Masters. And uh, in that I wanted, uh, Jangar was one of the five other masters. So uh, for this photograph, I asked uh, my museum photographer, I was in craft museum then, and I asked uh, <coughs> Jangar, I called for him and I said, Jangar, the photographer is waiting outside. Why don't you get yourself photograph for my catalog of the exhibition? So he said, Saab kapde khol du, meaning, shall I shed my clothes? He asked me. So I said, why are you asking such a funny question? So he said, a gallery in Delhi, when they did an exhibition of my painting, they asked me that if you dress up like European shirt and all that, then your work will not be considered authentic tribal. And therefore, so he said that the gallery dress him up as a, as a tribal again. A boy who came at the age of 13 to Bhopal, grew up only in a big city. He traveled world over. He was totally <laughs> urbanized and thing. But look at what market. And it is that market which took his life uh, at the end. Thank you very much. Okay, on, on the behalf of uh, everyone present here, I would like to thank our distinguished speaker, Dr. Jyotinder Jain, for so readily agreeing to de deliver this significant lecture on the modern and the contemporary in the vernacular arts of India. This lecture has been very inspiring to all of us present here. From the way Sir has explained each work, we are honored to, we are honored to witness this process. Thank you once again. And now we would like to thank the Dean of Essen School, Professor Thermal, and the Faculty of the Department of Fine Arts of Essen School, and the University for organizing this event in this semester. We, think, we thank our esteemed Vice Chancellor for providing his support and necessary administrative and, log and logistical support in organizing this event. The Office of the PRO and Ashish Thomas for helping us to publish this event in and beyond the University. For this, a sincere thanks to them. We would also thank the administrative staff of C.V. Raman Auditorium and the Department of Fine Arts who worked behind the scenes for this event to happen. And finally, we thank everyone who is present here for, and for witnessing this lecture.